We're going to take a look at the Scripture this morning, continuing on with Philippians. I'm skipping ahead a little bit today because I just feel like that uh, I've had something on my heart. Uh, and, you know, it's just kind of to do with current events. Uh, and I know that it's, it's really, and I'm going to talk about this here in a minute, so I don't want to talk about too much just yet. But how many of y'all are keeping up with the current events that are going on in the Middle East? I mean, there's a lot of people that, you know, are looking at it and think, oh, is this, is this it? Is this, is this the, the thing that's going to bring Jesus back? You know, is this, you know, the end times? I'm not here to talk about that this morning, even though we could. Uh, I don't know whether it is or whether it isn't. Uh, I will tell you this, this world is headed, no matter how you look at it, the Lord Jesus will come back someday. Amen? And is this the event that's going to you know, cause that to happen? I, I don't know that. I don't know that it isn't. And I don't think that's the point. That's not the point that I want to bring out this morning. I want us to, to I, I'm, I'm trying to explain too much. I'll explain as we go along. So, uh, but anyway, I want to talk about the subject, Enemies of the Cross. Now, this title is a little bit deceptive because I'm not talking about spiritual warfare here this morning. And I'm not talking about uh, necessarily people that are standing up against the faith. I want us to look at the enemies of the cross in a little bit different way. Because what did Jesus tell us to do with our enemies? You love them and you pray for them. Amen? And you do good to them. And so I want us to look at it a little bit different than maybe the title uh, gives you a thought of. Uh, but the title, Enemies of the Cross. We're going to look at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 through 21. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 through 21. He says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have us for an ensample or an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Lord, for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things to himself. If I may say this about that last verse, I want you to understand something. Jesus is in control, even though the world looks out of control. Amen? Don't you remember that? Because no matter how bad things get to looking around us, I want you to remember God is in control. And that he is able to subdue all things unto himself. In other words, everything that's going on is under him. I want you to understand that, that as it talks about subduing all things to himself, he's talking about not just things in the world, but he's talking about the entire universe in which he created. He is in control of it. Amen? There isn't a planet that moves. There isn't a, a, a star that burns out. There isn't a, a, a galaxy that is formed. There, I mean, listen, there is nothing that happens that is not under his control. He is in control of it all. And uh, so I just want to say that as a word of encouragement to you this morning. As the world seems to fall apart around us, Jesus, it's, he's in control. It's going to be okay. Amen? And uh, But... In saying that, don't be one of these people that says, hey, the world's falling apart around me. It's going to be okay. Jesus is in control, so I'm just going to sit back, relax, and, and do nothing. That is not what the Lord would have us to do. Uh, Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church and says, listen, some of y'all's got a problem. Some of y'all say Jesus is coming back, so let's just sit back and let's just don't worry about even working. Let's do nothing. Let's don't work physically. Let's don't work spiritually. Let's just sit back and enjoy the ride. And Paul says to them, listen, if you don't work, you don't eat. And he says, hey, uh, I want you to get busy doing the things that you need to do. Jesus is coming back. Absolutely, he for sure is. And because Jesus is coming back, that ought to make us even more busy 
in the things of the kingdom. Amen? So kind of keep all that in mind as we look at these passages of Scripture. So my initial thought on this sermon, because I would, let me just say this. When, when I was thinking about this sermon, it's been on my mind all week for the last couple of weeks, I guess, since all the stuff's been going on over in the Middle East and in Israel. And uh, I, I've been thinking, you know, about the Lord's return. I've been thinking about what the events are taking place and, and whether or not they fit in Scripture. And, and, you know, not that they don't fit, but just, you know, is this some of the stuff, this Scripture being fulfilled and all that? And I'm sure there's plenty of, of you know, people out there that are preaching on that. And I'm not against that at all, uh, as long as it's biblical and as long as it's accurate. Uh, but I don't want to get lost on all that stuff. Because I think what we have a tendency to do, we get lost uh, on all the, the things, you know, the, the, the prophecies, and we forget about the purpose of it. What is the purpose of knowing all this stuff? Well, God wants to warn us about what is coming, and for us that are believers, He wants to warn us about what is coming so that we'll get busy telling others about Jesus. Amen? And ought to compel us to do that. Uh, compel us to get busy. And if, listen, if there's somebody you need to talk to, uh, and I'm just telling you, we are surrounded, whether you realize it or not, we are surrounded by people that we need to be talking to. But if you're going to get it done, you might ought to get after it. Amen? So my initial thought on this sermon was if there's ever a time when we should be declaring the gospel, it is now. That was my initial thought. But as I wrote that down, as I began to, to think about this sermon and think about how to take notes on it, I thought, but that's not, that's not true. That's not the way to look at it. Because, yeah, is this the time that we should be sharing the gospel? Absolutely. But here's the thing. It's not true, necessarily, because we should have been declaring it all along. Amen? Amen? Why should I wait until something happens for me to get busy? How many of y'all have ever, how many of y'all are procrastinators in here? I'm a professional, by the way, on some things. Aaron, are you talking to Sean? Well, he's trying to raise my hand, but he's. Oh, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Trouble brewing up front here. I'm good at procrastination. And here's the deal a lot of times I'll wait until. I can't wait anymore because something's broken. Something bad is getting ready to happen, you know, or something like that. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. We need to, we need to be busy. We need to get busy. We should have already been busy declaring the gospel of Christ. Amen? That is our purpose. Listen, our purpose as a church, our purpose uh, as Christians is to bring glory to God. And to bring glory to God is to declare God to a lost and dying world. And that begins with ourselves personally, that, that we are, you know, glorifying God in our own personal life, that we're glorifying God in our homes, and that we're glorifying God in, in every place that we go. That's why Paul wrote and said this to, I believe, in the book of Corinthians. He said, you're a sweet savor of Christ in every place. Everywhere you go ought to, ought to permeate Jesus. Everyone you're around, they ought to, perm you know, Jesus should be permeating from your life, and they ought to be able to notice there's something different and unique about the way that you live, the way that you talk, the way that you think, the compassion that you have, the words that you use, and so on and so forth. And, and it, ought, it just ought to come out in your life, and people ought to be able to notice it uh, in us. So should, we should have been declaring the gospel all along. And if you have waited till now to even think about doing that, I'm glad that you've come to that place, but put it off no longer. Amen? As a matter of fact, I believe one of the greatest failures of the church today, and I can only speak to today and not yesteryear. I'm not that old yet. I'm getting there, by the way. But I think about one of the great failures of the modern church today is we like to keep our personal faith personal. Amen? Y'all understand what I'm saying? Oh, you have your faith, I have mine. Let's just all keep it to ourselves. Listen, that is not what Jesus commanded us to do. Jesus said, go into all the world and teach. Amen? 
and you baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Listen, what he's saying is, as you bring, you bring the true faith of the gospel into people's lives, they become believers, you baptize them, and then you begin to disciple them and teach them how to live. Listen, God gives us the rep- recipe for it. And I believe that one of the, again, one of the greatest failures that we have experienced is, is we have kept our personal faith personal. In other words, we have not shared it with other people. I'm going to tell you something. You look at what Jesus has done for you. If you're a saved person this morning, what has Jesus done for you? I was thinking about that song that Grant picked out the sing while ago. It's one of my favorite hymns, Nothing But the Blood. Listen, if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus, where would I be? I would at best be living and lost, or at worst, I'd be already dead and in hell. Amen? And when I say living and lost, I'm talking about living in this physical body, dead in my spirit, lost in my life, in my spirit, on my way to eternal judgment in hell. Had Jesus not died for me, I would have no hope. Think about what he's done. How can I keep that to myself? How can I not declare it? I say this, it is sin not to declare it. Amen? Now, thinking about current events and and why this is on my mind, and I'm only going to speak of this briefly. If any of y'all been keeping up with any news at all, you know that, that there's a lot of turmoil going on in the Middle East. And we all know that really, you know, all the prophecies and and things that are given to us in Scripture all deal with Israel. It all revolves around Israel. I know as Americans, sometimes we think it all revolves around us. Listen, it all revolves around that little bitty country over there. Amen? As God's chosen nation. And we see what's going on over there. And we see what's happening. And of course, our minds automatically, if you know anything about Scripture at all, our minds automatically go to the book of Ezekiel in chapter 38 and 9. And we think about, you know, all the countries that are involved in this battle that Ezekiel uh, foretold about that has not yet happened. And we think, is this it? Is this the one? And rightly so. I think it's okay for us to think like that. I think it's okay for us to dig into Scripture and learn about that and understand it. But don't get lost in it. Don't forget about your purpose. Why should we care? Listen, I'm going to heaven. I'm born again. If you're born again, you're going to heaven. And, and all that stuff, is it important? It absolutely is important. It wouldn't be, if it wasn't important, it wouldn't be in the Scripture. Amen? But don't get lost in it and spend all your time in it without understanding its full purpose. And the purpose for it is, as I may say again, is God wants to warn a lost world about his coming judgment because he is a righteous and holy God and he is a righteous and holy judge. And because of that, he will uphold his law and he will uphold his judgment and judgment is coming. And it is not going to be good for those that are unsaved and unprepared for it. Amen? Listen, the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of God. I'm not quoting that just exactly right, but listen, it's a fearful thing. It's a fearful thing to stand in the judgment of God, amen? How many of y'all with me this morning? This is serious business. And the reason that we need to know more about that stuff and the reason that we wonder about it is not because we're just fascinated with it, Although it is fascinating, but the real reason is, is because we need to, we need to be compelled to want to tell others about Jesus and the coming judgment. Now then, it ought to cause us to be moved with compassion for the unsaved. You see, I think the church, and I I wrote down, this is just my thought here, I I probably need to add to this. I think that the church of the past 75 or 100 years maybe has been lulled to sleep. And what I mean by that, it's been lulled to sleep by the enemy, by Satan himself. What I mean is that the church of America's past was respected. And the church of America's past was, you know, 
kind of held up. And if a person, uh, you know, wanted to get saved or they had something going on in their life and they needed some answers, they thought, well, I'll go down to the local church. And people just had this kind of sense of understanding and respect for the church and, and respect for the Word of God and for the things of God in the past. But we're living in different times. Bridget gave me some statistics. I didn't write them down. I probably should have uh, kind of that went along with that. But how many of y'all know, I know, I remember one of them. How many of y'all know that 40% of the people in America do not know what Easter is even about? They have no idea. I was one of them when I was a boy. When I was a child, uh, we, I had no idea what Easter was about. I thought Easter was about the Easter bunny. I thought the Easter was about doing eggs. I thought Easter was about Easter baskets. I had no idea at 10, 11, 12 years old that Jesus had died for my sins and rose from the dead. I was one of those people. I had no idea. And I'm 51 years old now, so, and things, you think things are better now than they were then, you're wrong. It's like this. In the book of Acts, and I know I've explained this before, but I just think it's such a great example. In the book of Acts chapter 2, you find that Peter and the disciples preached a sermon and they did not have to explain to those people what sin was because those people had a general idea about sin and he explained to them about the crucifixion and the resurrection, but they had this understanding of what sin was because they, just, they knew the Word of God. But then you go into the book of Acts chapter 17 and you find Paul dealing with the entire different set of people and you find him dealing with people in Athens and, and those people were heathen people. They had no idea what the Word of God says. And Paul's trying to tell them about Jesus and his resurrection and they said, what is he even talking about? And they, they went on and, and some of the philosophers said, let's go hear what this babbler has to say. He says such weird stuff. Let's go listen to him. They didn't understand about the resurrection. They didn't understand about the crucifixion. They didn't understand about Jesus' sacrifice. Why? Because they didn't know the Word of God. And I think a lot of times what we're trying to do in church today is we're trying to tell people they need a Savior without even understanding why. Amen? I'm just saying the church of today is a little bit different than the church of the past. Because the church of the past, it was kind of respected and, and people in general knew right from wrong, but people today have no idea what right and wrong even means. People often went to church just to have something to do, right? How many of y'all remember going, some of y'all are old enough, maybe, to remember going to church because it was just something to do. I mean, there was nothing else to do. I mean, they had a church event. Man, we go to the church because there's nothing else to do. It's just, it's a time that we can get together. And, and, it, was, and it was maybe back in the past, it was, a, it was a time to stay connected with one another and connected with what was going on in the community and connected with other people and things. But I want you to understand something about the church of today. The church of the day is we got more to do than we know what to do with. People aren't coming to church for that reason anymore. And not only that, but you talk about people staying connected. We're connected to everybody and everything at our fingertips. Amen? I'm just, I'm just saying that the church of the past has been lulled to sleep by the enemy, thinking that we can just do things the way that we've always done, and it's going to work out all right. The people, in other words, the mistake that we have made, and what I mean by all that is that the mistake that we have made is that thinking because Cedar Ridge exists, people will come to us. It's a mistake. I'm telling you right now, the world is not knocking down these doors to get in. Amen? And we, we think, well, the church is here. Let them come to us. I say the church is here. Let's go to them. Amen? Amen? Let's go to them. Let's, let's live it in our daily life. Let's do it right. Let's preach the Word of God. Let's teach the Word of God. Let's go out into the world. Jesus said, go out. Don't go into the world and preach the gospel. Don't wait for the world to come to you. You see, I want you to understand something about the world. The world ain't looking for God. They're looking for something. 
They didn't love God first. The Bible says that God loved them first. Amen? The Bible says that Jesus left the 99 and went out and sought the one that was lost. You see, Jesus wants us to be proactive. What we need to do, what we need to do is wake up and become proactive and start taking the gospel into the world. The book of Romans chapter 13, verse 11 says, and that knowing the time, listen to what he says, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation or the return of the Lord nearer than when we believed. And if that was true then, it is certainly true now. Amen? Time is running out. The clock is continues to tick. Is this event that's going on in the Middle East the thing that's going to make that happen? I do not know, but I, and it doesn't matter. Listen, time is going forward. Time is getting shorter, amen? The time to speak of Jesus is now. The night is far spent. The day is at hand, or the day of the Lord is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. He's saying, listen, you need to start living for Jesus. You need to start doing it right because Jesus has been gone from this world for 2,000 years. He was here. He died for our sins. He rose again. His spirit is in the world. He's here through the Holy Spirit. He's here through the church. But when it says the night is far spent, it is speaking of when Jesus ascended into heaven. And that time is far spent. He said the day of his return, it is at hand. Let us, therefore, knowing that, let's do it right. Let's start living for God. And not only that, he's saying, hey, the time is at hand. It's time for you to wake up. Wake out of sleep because the return of the Lord is coming I'm going to tell you something. you got somebody you need to talk to Jesus about. You better get after it. Amen? You better get to it. The time is at hand. Philippians, let's look back at the book of Philippians. Philippians 3, 17, he says, Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them, which all walk so as ye have for us, have us for an example. Let me just say this, and I'm not going to spend much time on this verse at all. But he says, listen, I want you to be followers of me because Paul's not bragging on himself. He's not got the big head. He's just saying, listen, I'm doing it right. I'm a good example. You guys need to follow me. Now, I know that sounds like he's boasting a little bit, uh, but I don't think he is. He's just telling them up flat out, listen, I, I know how to live for God. I'm a mature Christian. Follow me. And if you can't follow me because he's in prison at this point in time, he says, then mark those which follow after my example because they can be your example, okay? I'm going to tell you, I, I thought I could preach a whole sermon on this, especially to you young people. Because young people have a tendency to look up to other young people or idle people, you know, people that are something in society or, or we have a tendency to follow after trends and, and all that kind of thing. And we think, I want to be like that, I want to be like that. Listen, you need to be careful who you want to be like. Amen? Because not everybody is to be followed. Now let's look on and see what he says here in verse 18 and 19. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, I want you to notice something about this verse, and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, hence the title to my sermon. So he says, watch us, mark us, make sure you're following after people like us, because there are those who are enemies of the cross, and I don't want you following them. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Now I want to talk about these enemies of the cross, and I want us to look at Paul's response to them. First of all, the enemies of the cross, they're not just atheists. They're not just pagans, or what we would call pagans. Okay, they're not just out there, you know, uh, they're, they're not just the vilest of sinners. And I want to be careful what I say on that, because I don't want to go against what we learned in Sunday school, and that is, 
You got people that are religious that are lost, and you got people that are just flat out living wicked lives, and they're lost. Both are lost. Amen? One is no better than the other. As a matter of fact, what Paul is saying here is the people that are pagans, the people that are atheists, the people that are just standing up against the things of God because they're just wicked and they know it. He said they're not nearly as dangerous as the people who profess to be something who are nothing. Amen? Y'all understand what I'm saying? Some of the greatest enemies of the cross is not the atheist. The greatest enemy of the cross is the person who says, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, and they live lives that are absolutely opposed to the gospel. Why are they such enemies of the cross? Because they are saying the cross has no power. Amen? The cross makes no difference. Listen, if you're a true born-again Christian here this morning, the cross ought to be making a difference in the way that you live. Amen? I mean, if you're a true born-again Christian this morning, the cross ought to be making a difference on how you talk. It ought to be making a difference on how you think. It ought to be making a difference in your attitude. It ought to be making a difference in your daily walk. Listen, it ought to be making a difference when you get up and go to work tomorrow. Amen? All right? Listen, the cross, the enemies of the cross, the greatest enemies of the cross are the people who profess to be something, but they are nothing. All right? They're false converts. They're people whom the, have a form of religion but they deny the power thereof. And Paul says this about those people. And you might say, well, we need to to straighten them people out. Well, that's true, but how do we do that? We're going to do it with the glorious gospel of Christ just like any other. But but I want you to notice something about Paul's attitude toward these people. There's two things. Number one, he was concerned about their deception toward true believers. He was concerned about the effect they would have on the true believers in the Philippian church. He said, you need to mark these people. You need to mark those that are followers of me and follow their example. And you also need to be careful about those who profess to be something but are not. Because what you're going to end up doing is you're going to look at them and you say, well, they do it. I can do it. Right? They think this way, so it's okay for me to think this way. They're Christians, so am I. You need to be careful. Because there are many false doctrines. There are many false converts. There are many false beliefs out there that are contrary to the cross of Christ. And he was concerned about the effect their deception would have on the church. So that was concern number one. And I believe that broke his heart because of of his worry for these people and for the health of this church. But number two... And I think this is probably the biggest reason. He had compassion on their fate. I think he had true sorrow and compassion for these people. They were so deceived. People who are enemies of the cross, deceived in their sin. Notice what he says in verse 19. Their end is what? Destruction. I want you to notice something. Their end is destruction. What does he mean by that? People that are unsaved, and especially the religious lost, the Bible tells us their end is destruction. Understand something about these people. They're going to go to hell. Amen? Does that concern you this morning? Have you, how many of all have a loved one that is not saved? Raise your hand. Does that concern you? How much does it concern you? Does it concern you enough to do something about it? I mean, does it concern you enough to at least go to God in earnest prayer for that person? I mean, we don't even do that. Amen? I mean, does it concern you enough to to pray that God would open up a a door of opportunity for you to, to minister to that person? I mean, how much do you really care? You say, oh, I care, I care. Show me. Ain't that what James said? Show me. You say you got faith, show me. I say I got faith, show me. That's what he's saying. Listen, uh, I I know that I, I mentioned this last week too, but 
I just want you to, to think about what we say and then what we do. Do they match up? We say we're concerned about the lost, but we don't do anything about it. We say, well, they can come to church. Remember what I said at the beginning of the sermon? Well, the church is here. They can come here if they want to. That is not what they're going to do. We're going to have to take it to them. Amen? Destruction, their end, their end is eternal judgment. God is their belly. You see, what he's saying is, whose God is their belly. What does he mean by that? That's a weird phrase. What he's saying is, is they are controlled by their lust, like you are controlled by hunger. How many of y'all have ever been so hungry, you just thought, I'm going to die? Now, you might not have thought, I'm really going to die. But you've, you, how many of y'all have ever said that? I'm so hungry, I'm just starving to death. How many of y'all have ever said that? We all said that, right? And you smell something good cooking, and you think, man, I got to get me some of that. I am so hungry. Some of y'all might be thinking that right now. Say, man, I wish you'd shut up. I'm so hungry. <laughs> and you're controlled. What I'm saying is when you got those deep, I mean, them them deep hunger pains. You about do anything to get something to eat. That's what he's saying about these people's lust. He's saying they are controlled by their lust. Understand something about lost people. Their end is destruction. They are controlled by the lusts of this world. I mean, they, they just, they're enslaved by it. They mind earthly things, or shame is their glory. We see this all around us. Shame is their glory. He says, whose glory is in their shame. What's he mean by that? He's saying they take pride in their evil. In other words, don't you tell me what to do. Don't you tell me about my sin. I'm, I like doing what I'm doing. I, I, I like what's going on. Listen, that's the attitude of the world. And what we do as Christians, we get all mad about it sometimes. And we think, well, they need to, they'll just get what they deserve. That is not Jesus' attitude. Amen? If I got what I deserved, I would be in hell. Amen? You got what you deserved, you'd be in hell. I want you to understand something. Their glory is in their shame. They take pride in their sin. They see nothing wrong with it. Understand, they are deceived. And then last of all, he says, they mind earthly things. They are completely controlled by this world. They are enslaved by it. They're enslaved by it, and they don't even know it. The Bible tells us this, and this is, we ought to have compassion for people. I mean, we hear people say harsh and, and, and I'm not telling you, and here's the thing, I know that it's so tempting to say, well, if I don't speak harsh words toward these people, then it's as if I'm going along with it. I don't have to, I can love people and not go along with what they're doing. Amen? I can speak truth, and I can speak truth in love. And I can speak truth and true concern for the eternity of their, you know, their eternal fate. I'm not saying, listen, I know you say, well, the scripture says some people you love and you bring them to the faith through love. And other people you just hate the very sin that they're living in and you get real about it and you get serious about it and you get blunt about it and you bring them to the cross that way, hating the very sin. I mean, there's different methods to different things, but ultimately it is all about this, is because I love them people. And I want to tell them the truth. He says, in whom, I want you to notice something, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, whom the God Satan of this world had blinded the minds of them which believed not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Understand something about lost people. They're blind. They can't see. And we see lost people stumbling, stumbling, stumbling. And just like if I was up here and I was blind and I couldn't see a thing and I fell off this stage, you all wouldn't go, ha, that's so, he's so stupid, he fell off this stage. No, I'm blind, I can't help it. Right? 
What would you think if I was blind up here and I was wandering closer to the edge of the stage, I tripped over this altar and fell on my face, and then Sandy jumps up and says, oh, look at that, he's so dumb. What would all the rest of you think? You'd all look at her and say, you need to sound shut up. He's blind. You all feel sorry for him, right? I mean, anybody with any... Any standard at all would never take a, a blind person and make fun of them because they're blind. All of us would say, hey, that's not right. Don't do that. Stop. The same way ought to be looked at the people of the world. They are stumbling over sin. They are falling on their faces. They are getting hurt. They are, they are, they are dying. And yet we as Christians... Look at them and say, oh, they're just so stupid. And they're just, oh, they're just getting what they deserve. What should we be doing? Well, what are you doing? What would you do if I was blind up here, tripped over this altar, fell on my face? Would you all just sit back and relax and say, boy, I wonder if he's going to make it. I hope he gets up. I think he's bleeding a little bit, but he'll be all right. No, what you'd do, I would hope to shout that maybe Sean and Dennis would jump up out of their seats and Grant and come up there and help me get out of the floor and help me back on my feet and, set me by, and try to help me to get on the right path. That's what we ought to be doing as a church. That's what we ought to be doing as Christians. The world's dying in their sin. Listen, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. Their glory is their shame. They are controlled and enslaved by this world. And we sit back and say, big deal. And they're slaves. Did you know you and I have the keys of freedom? Huh? We hold them in our hands as, as Christians. We can set them free. Now I know you said, well, I can open the door, but they got to walk through it. I get that. I do. But let's at least open the door. Amen? I want us to look at two more passages of Scripture. I put some different background on here because I want to drive this point home. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 through 38. Because I want you to remember, you say, why you got a picture of these hot air balloons? You had something on that last week. Because I want you to remember something. This is where I want us to get. I want us to learn to love, serve, and know God so that we can love, serve, and know our families and others. I want us to be able to reach new heights for Jesus, to become excellent in our ministry to others. And this is how we're going to do it. We're going to follow Jesus' as example. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then said he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray you therefore that the Lord of that harvest, that he would send forth labors into his harvest. That's what God wants to do with us. Amen? That's what he wants to do with this church. That's what he wants to do with me. That's what he wants to do with you. That's what he wants to do with my family. That's what he wants to do with my children. That's what he wants to do with all of us in this building this morning who are professing the name of Jesus. He wants us to go into the harvest. Amen? And he wants us to begin to work the fields of this world. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to have to get to know Him and so we can fall in love with Him and so that then we can learn how to serve Him. And last of all, Julie, if you come to the piano for me, please. I want you to remember to know God, to love God, and to serve God so that we can learn how to love, to know, or to know, love, and serve our families, know, love, and serve others. But it begins with God. Amen? Listen, if I could learn and know God, I mean really get to know God, I will, I will have a deeper love for God, which will put me in a deeper service with God. 
And if I can do that, all that other stuff will fall into place. Amen? It starts with God. You say, I know him, I'm saved, but how well do you know him? I said last week, you, don't, you, you love him little because you don't know him much, right? And because you don't love him much, you don't serve him very well. Get to know him. Get to know him. How do we know him? Through the word of God, through prayer. Yes, I know those are, are what generic terms that's been used forever. Read your Bible, read your Bible, pray. It's kind of like that song, Sir Mernus has the little children sing, read your Bible, Pray every day and you'll grow, grow, grow. Hey, it's true, right? Simple but true. Our church ought to be all about knowing God. Amen. Everything we, ought, we do ought to revolve about how to get to know God better. Amen. So that we can love God deeper. So that we can serve Him better. If you will, let's stand please this morning.